Well, a very good evening to everybody in the UK and uh, good afternoon to those of you in the United States. Welcome to the 14th Living God's Future Now conversation, which we have on the second Thursday of each month, and we have done since the pandemic took hold last spring. Uh, Heart Edge, which runs the Living God's Future Now conversations, is an international ecumenical movement for the renewal of the broad church. It talks about catalyzing kingdom communities. And one way we have of doing that is to run an online festival, which we've been running for the last 15 months, considering all the issues of the day, or many of them, including race and commerce and the climate and a host of other things. Uh, yesterday, we were talking about a theology of disagreement a very Anglican thing to be talking about. Uh, I'm really thrilled you've been able to join us. My guest today is Lucy Winkett. Lucy Winkett is my neighbour at St James Piccadilly, uh, a greatly uh, admired figure in not just the Church of England, but the wider church in this country and beyond. Um, She's been my neighbour for the whole of my time at St Martin the Fields. I think she's been at St James Piccadilly for maybe a year longer than me, perhaps about 10 years now. Um, we're going to talk together for uh, a good bit of time. And then uh, towards the end, I'm going to start trying to integrate uh, some of the questions and comments that you put in the chat. Uh, I'll do my best to do so. But if the conversation's moved on beyond your point, then everyone will still enjoy it by being able to read it in the chat. I may not have uh, the facility or Lucy may not have the facility to integrate it into our conversation, but we do appreciate the comments and questions that you play and we'll run up till seven o'clock UK time. So the subtitle of the series of conversations is Improvising God's Kingdom. Uh, in that spirit, and thinking about the experience of the pandemic over the last 16 months or so, Lucy, how's it been for you? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. First of all, I mean, it's really good to be here just down the road. It was lovely to walk, uh, just walk down the road um, to be here today. So it's lovely to see you all. Um, how's it been for, well, there's two answers to that question. How's it been for me and how's it been for us? Mm. Um, and do I think you want to start with us. And, yeah, and us. Go to you. well, I think I think improvising is probably a really good way of talking about it, actually, because there I'm a jazz fan and there have been, you know, regular chord changes that haven't changed throughout the pandemic from before and will continue. So regular pattern of worship, prayer at the center of our life as a, as a community, as a gathered community, um, which kind of, you know, that goes through a bit like a kind of eight bar blues, if you like. On the top of that, we have been improvising slightly crazily um, and and really feeling as if we've been making it up as we've gone along. Um, some of that's I think been to do with our our place as a central city community and city centres obviously have had a particularly acute time of it um, in in the pandemic but um, but some of it has just been because we've um, We've we've tried we've tried really hard from the first moment actually to try to to this that's, this sounds like a slightly ridiculous phrase but to kind of go to go towards it to go towards it rather than rather than retreat from it um, I'm not entirely sure what that what that means uh, overall but one of the things it meant and perhaps this comes to me comes to me that, that just immediately it was apparent to me that. I should on the first day get on YouTube, having never live streamed anything in my life. I should just put that at me and say and invite from then on, really. Um, and here we are, you know, 14, 15 months later. And thankfully we have a, a fantastic team of people, but they're still leading midday prayer on YouTube as they have done every day from day one. So tell us about you in that story. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'm a parish priest. Um, I, I think that for every parish priest, there was a, it, it seems to me, just speaking to people, there was a good deal of confusion to start with. And, you know, to, to, get, the, to get the message that 
you must shut your church and public worship is suspended. Um, and then a bit later on, um, you can't go into your church. All of those things, you know, one after the other were things I just never thought I would, I never thought I would get that message or have to have to do that thing. Um, so and how do you celebrate the Eucharist when there's no one there um, in person? Everything felt very, very quickly, very chaotic. And it, it, it just seemed to me that my role in that, which was both a blessing and a cost, was to be kind of utterly present, faithful, uh, and be, be perhaps the cord, the cord changes underneath, or try to be yeah. somehow that, while everything else seemed to be very, very chaotic. Um, and, and in that sense, just to push that analogy just one more time, yeah. is to say that um, if, if our main role as priests, I think, is to be signposts, we're pointing, we're pointing away from ourselves as far as we can to a kind of a greater reality and a deeper truth then my main job actually in that first first bit was to listen and to, to, to see if I could hear where that uh, where those chord changes came um, while every, everything else just really did seem like it was it, it was it was very confusing and it was very chaotic and it was I guess at one level quite frightening mm. and and tell us about what what the continuities were you know you 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 you've talked about the experience of not being able to go into the church not being able to preside the eucharist or not in the same way or tell us about what you have still been as a priest to your community that hasn't changed mm. I, I mean it, it actually made me think about time in a different way i think time itself seemed to um, both collapse and contract so that um, it seemed that everything was happening at once and one, one of my favorite um, one of my favorite uh, kind of concepts I suppose is that time is God's gift to us to stop everything happening at once it's, it's a mercy in itself um, so in a situation where it seemed that everything was kind of coming coming at you at, at the same time one of the things that really helped me personally and perhaps that's why I did it was to be absolutely there at midday, once a day, um, in that very kind of um, uh, rhythmic and, and faithful way. I didn't find that difficult at all. Um, and I think perhaps because it was feeding something that I, I needed, which was, a, which was a rhythm. But who have I been to this community? I, I, I'm not the right person to ask. You should ask the congregation. Mm -hmm. um, if I wanted to take a guess, I think I have wanted to, um, wanted to be present and to be full of as much reassurance as I could possibly be. But I think one of the one of the things I've noticed about leadership in this time is that because no one has known what is going on and no one has had the, the kind of the map or the answers, mm. the, the thing that has been in most, the, 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 the quality that has been needed most has been mercy between us. A lot of forgiveness has been needed. I've needed a lot of forgiveness when I've made mistakes and um, trust. And so if, if, you, if you as a priest or if you as a leader hadn't had or hadn't been able to cultivate a culture that prized mercy and trust before, mm. then you really needed to do it. You really needed to do it in this in this chaotic situation. So th those two things I've found have been, have been important and, um, and have been balms in, in mm. what's been a, a sore situation. And is it fair to say that mercy and trust are the very center of the Christian faith? I, I mean, I, I, would, I would say so. Um, I'm sure other people would have other, other ways of putting it, but but yes, and we'll, I, we'll come on to this, I guess. But I think something that's exercised me a lot has been what has what has kept us together. What, who are we? Who have we been? And particularly in this, in our context, we're a gathered community, so we're not a local community. We haven't been seeing each other on our daily exercise. You know, we have only seen each other on Zoom or um, or connected on YouTube for a really long time. And 
um, also people traveling, you know, traveling to the city center, we couldn't encourage people to do that. It, it, would, be, it would have been the wrong thing to do. So that I think that's had a particular dynamic um, attached to it. One of the things that's exercised me is then in that context, how do how do you celebrate the Eucharist, which is all about connection and and the physicality of eating and drinking together. Um, at, at the heart of that story, of course, is the is the merciful act of God and the trust that is um, cultivated by you sharing food and drink in an equitable way. Mm -hmm. So, of course, but I, I think for me, those two those two qualities, I've had to rest on them and to try to to try to understand what they mean in a really new way. And I feel I've grown, you know, painfully and and fast um, over the past year in a way that I, I was joking about the technology, but I said something to somebody at one, at one point. I said, I don't think I've learned this much this fast since I was 12. Mm. And, you know, when I was trying to get to grips with French or whatever it was at mm. school. And that that exponential pace of learning has been very, very challenging, exhilarating, and also, yeah, painful to some degree. Can, can we stay with those two words, mercy and trust, for, for a bit? Could you tell us more about trust, maybe, to start with? Uh, tell us a bit about what the word trust has meant to you and, and what you've learned about it in the last 16 months. Um, I think that, I think that trust between, well, first of all, trust in God, has been difficult. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not one of those individuals. As an individual Christian, I'm. I'm not a person who generally asks God why things happen. I, I'm not a kind of. I rail at God and I question God a lot. I challenge God a lot. But in terms of the um, the theodicy question or the suffering question, I that that's not been part of my spirituality. So I. I it's not so much that. It's really. Um, if the movement of the spirit in Genesis is to bring order out of chaos, then where is that movement of the spirit when all seems really chaotic for a really long time? Um, and I, I didn't like all of the war analogies. I didn't like the kind of um, the battling analogies um, that were they were quite prevalent to start with. Hmm. Um, I felt it was much more it was much more dismantling of communities than that. And again, you know, my instinct, just in terms of trust, my instinct in a, in a really tough situation, I, I play the piano, would be to get everyone together, you know, get, get some beer, get the get the piano out mm. and just just sing our way through it or, you know, tr get, get ourselves together. And that was precisely the thing that you couldn't do in this situation. So the whole kind of war stuff didn't didn't make any sense <laughs> to me um, because in war you, you would you would get together and in this particular particular situation the only thing that was saving us was keeping ourselves apart from each other so in that situation trust becomes incredibly important and very difficult to maintain um, i think zoom is not a format that um, that handles disagreement or conflict very well and so in in trying to decide what to do in trying to discern the way forward um, you would again ordinarily in person you'd be able to kind of just have a bit more room and a bit more um uh, you, you could be able to communicate in ways other than with words so with your with your body with your um with your silences with your um capacity to kind of you know exchange with each other that's much more difficult online so i think trust is very easily eroded in that in those kind of rather metallic boxy ways of communicating for all the brilliance of mm -hmm. for all the brilliance of it um that's been very that's been very difficult so trust in god tricky trust in each other very tricky i think um trust in leadership has been hard because it's patent that the leaders don't know <laughs> any more really yes. yeah. uh than the rest of us um so and, and if you're in if you're in any kind of leadership role in a community then that's come at us. You know, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you think mm. about about the role of trust in this situation. But anyone who's tried to be a re a representative person in a community, like a priest, it, of course, it's it's really it's been really um, it has been tough. 
Would you say that? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm just going to say to those watching, unfortunately, my eyesight isn't good enough to see the size of the writing that we have for the for the chat. So what I'm going to do is to ask Jonathan uh, about 10 minutes from the end to actually pull together the questions and, and we'll respond to those uh, as Jonathan dictates then rather than interrupting as we usually do on this because I think uh, I'm not going to be able to read I'm afraid. So uh, let, can we just move on to Mercy and then maybe I can sweep back and, sure. and um, so you've talked I mean really poignantly about about trust. Could you could you talk about Mercy because I when you talked about people uh, getting cross with leaders I, I mean you couldn't possibly be talking about about yourself I don't think for a moment I mean, it's impossible <laughs> to imagine anyone being cross with you no but um but I imagine mercy comes into that on a on a personal level as well well yes but I think uh, you know it's not an accident that in the bible mercy and truth are met together um and I think whenever truth is told and what happened in the pandemic was that a lot of very uncomfortable truth was revealed and the I mean just in terms of our society mm -hmm. the kind of you know the the, 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 it was ruthlessly exposed, the injustices and inequalities with which we live. And when truth is told, mercy is needed. And I, you know, that's true about myself before God. Whenever the truth is told about me or whenever I try to tell the truth, mercy is necessary. And um, so I think in that sense, we, we have been, we've been in a kind of very bracing um, truth telling moment as a society which is a good thing, clearly, mm -hmm. but along that, alongside that has to come a measure of mercy. We, we have to be merciful with ourselves um, as well as, you know, attempting to be merciful with each other or to develop a culture that is itself merciful. Mm -hmm. that, I, th I feel that's something I've really tried to, tried to think about. We, we've got it, we've got it so, you know, I personally, and we, of course, we've got it wrong time and time and time again. That's the point. <laughs> that's the whole point. <laughs> that's why mercy is. That's why mercy is needed because the truth is that we will continue to get it wrong. One of the interesting things for me is that, you know, the first thing you you think if you adopt a scriptural worldview is, oh well, the um, this is this is a plague. This has been sent as the fifth of the different. Uh, persecutions that uh, like, you know and, and and then of course church leaders have said oh no, no I don't believe God works like that but what you're saying in some ways is that what we've been given it, you know we've taken the lid off our society or the pandemic has taken the lid off society and and what we what what happens when we take the lid off is judgment in a sense that's what judgment is you you see what everybody's up to when the lights go on let's put it in a crude metaphor um and what you're talking about, I think, is is the fact that judgment without mercy is is cruel and destructive. Um, but judging with mercy is redemptive and restorative. And transformative. Mm. So I, I yes, I, I think that I think that's right. And I think that, you know, I, I was reflecting, I mean, all of us have had to preach our way through this, haven't mm. we, as well? And so the seasons come around and and I remember thinking in Advent, I've always rather been attracted to the to the really apocalyptic themes of Advent, death, judgment, heaven and hell. I mean, the fashion now is actually to move away from those a little bit and to think of other ways of um, interpreting um, Advent. But I, I rather like that, you know, the end times in those four weeks before Christmas. And I, I remember thinking that um, death has been stalking our land, either personally or, or by reputation. Um, judgment people you know that's been really harsh yeah. on some on some level heaven um the air has been cleaner the birds yeah. have been audible the um the planes have stopped flying and there are some people for whom this has been an absolute blessing and we yeah. you can't you know um you can't ignore that and hell clearly for you know for some of our congregation who are working in care homes at the beginning with with you know not enough ppe mm. there were some desperate zoom calls mm. and some desperate phone calls around that time um which were really 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 tough for them mm. Mm. so you've talked about um if i take you back to the that poignant picture you painted at the beginning of, of not being able to celebrate the eucharist not being able to go into the church mm. and then your instinct to gather people around the piano uh, and all the touch and the camaraderie and the conviviality that goes with that. Um, 
the Eucharist is clearly very important to your notion of faith. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's quite common in churches like yours and mine to say, you know, to end a sermon by saying, and so we move to the Eucharist as if that somehow explained everything. Could you just for a few moments talk about what a Eucharistic shaped community, what, I mean, it's a, it's a well-known mm. phrase, it's a phrase that clergy use a lot, but they don't always say precisely what that means. Could you say precisely what that means to you? <laughs> Not precisely, no. But I think I think the thing that was most challenging about this for me as a as a as a person was that I think I, I hope I'm going to use the right word here, but I think I am a kinesthetic learner. I learn by doing rather than by other means, and we all do to some extent. But I think that's how I really genuinely learn most. So the the difficult thing about this Eucharistic moment was that the Eucharist became something that you talked about rather than did together yeah. and the thing that's been so you know, the thing that's so still surprises me I mean I'm, I'm you know I'm easily easily shocked guess I guess but the thing that still surprises me about a kind of regular Sunday morning in the middle of this city is that people can walk into our church and they just get stuff for free mm. of bread and wine they you know they and they will eat it with other people that they've never met before and I think to do, doing it is really important rather than just talking about the night before he died. So, mm -hmm. so the movement from the movement from um, flesh back to word, I didn't appreciate <laughs> very much as uh, in terms of what's the Edwin Muir phrase that the, the 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 word made flesh is here made word again. I think it's right. about the Church of Scotland. <laughs> okay, right. Well, <laughs> exactly, and it's it kind of it went back to words and it just it didn't make any sense to me at all so um i mean that so yeah so in so what what's, what does the eucharist really if if we if we're celebrating it together and i you know again i i subscribe very strongly to that notion that all celebrate the eucharist one presides on behalf of the community but everyone is a celebrant in that sense um what what's the what's the point of it what's the moment that is um is being celebrated there I, I think, I think, I mean, it, it, we often say, we're often very proud of the fact that William Blake was baptised at our church. Mm. Okay, Born fantastic. in Soho and died in Charing Cross. There you go. He's a and local. He's, he's, he's ours. He's, he's, our, he's our local. Yeah. And, uh, and he was baptised at St. John. I mean, I think actually that was his last, first and last moment in it the church. He wasn't a big fan of church of England. Not really, no. no. <laughs> um, but, you know, his, his, his concept that eternity is in one hour and... Mm and heaven is in a wild flower yeah. and that, that, that he's playing with perspective that's what i really think i think what we're doing when we celebrate the eucharist is kind of jumping into you know a, like a waterfall and immediately going out of our depth we're drenched in this grace-filled um, moment this sacrament and so for 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 me i think that the renewal of i guess i want to say the church but i i would rather say something more um, broader, um, something broader than that. The renewal of human living can be found in a Eucharistic identity, which isn't a kind of narrowly defined sacrament of the church. Mm. It's, um, it's a way of living that is taking seriously our, um, our existence in eternity and our confinement for this moment in time. Mm. So very very basically i think the eucharist is a future oriented sacrament and it's it's a it's showing us the future as god wills it which is appropriate for this complicated Living conversation i hes so tell hesitate us more. to use your <laughs> tell, tell us more about me. what what being a future oriented sacrament what does that mean well i think it's it, uh you know ju just as just as the bread and wine are transformed however you want to describe yeah. that um or we're we're also transformed because we can we notice we notice the kingdom among us and we notice the the signs of that um which is that all are welcome all are fed no one is thirsty um there's a there's a fundamental celebration of who you are and who i am mm. together before god and um and at the same time in that in the life of jesus that is narrated and also present in that sacrament we're reminded too of our capacity for betrayal for our need for mercy for our violence our competitive instincts we're faced with ourselves in a very fundamental way but in a way that we can bear and and then we're fed 
So that there's something there's something really extraordinary, it seems to me, about about a Eucharist that shows you what human life could really be like if we if we stepped into it and lived it. Um, so that so the the ritualistic practice of the Eucharist is just a it's just a it's that it's a rehearsal and it's a reminder and it's a returning to that altar where uh, as I said all are fed all are welcome and no one is left thirsty and no one is left behind. So I wonder if that's you know put its finger on it for me what you've just said puts its finger on what the last what's been so hard for people like you and me I mean you know mm. who haven't had the virus ourselves and so on but mm. what's been so hard as clergy <clears throat> and as Christians has been if you say as you just said that uh, our, our job in worship in a general sense um, not necessarily robes and what, what not um, is to offer an example of what life can be like that feels in some ways precisely what we haven't been able to do mm. in the last 60 months because mm. you know it's wonderful that we're able to speak with so many people in this conversation now mm. but i don't think any of us would pretend that, that talking together to a screen mm. is is an example of what life can be like mm. i think we all have higher aspirations beyond <laughs> that and mm. and so that that whole sense of of striving and you know it does occasionally happen to me been more more problematic in, in the last 16 months but there can be a Sunday morning there can be a Wednesday night when we have had an act of worship in which something has actually happened as opposed to just being said and done but mm. something you felt something has actually happened and maybe as the pastor you can see it happening you can see two people sharing a piece who mm. wouldn't normally mm. occupy the same space with each other mm. uh, you can see a person shedding a tear in confession because you know what's on their heart you know, you can see a person coming forward to receive communion because they've been back to church for the first time after a long time away for all, any uh, 100 different reasons. But something's happening, and therefore it's an example of what life can be like, you know. And we haven't been able to see a lot of those things. Yeah. That, that, to me, puts its finger on what we've lost in the last 16 months and what we're longing for. There's a lovely um, phrase from a poem by Philip Wilbur, which says um, something like... Um, all we do is touched by ocean, but we stand on the shore of what we know. And I've often thought that Sunday mornings is, is or, or the celebration of the Eucharist, but you know, the, the shorthand would be Sunday morning. But sometimes I've, I've regretted that that describes Sunday morning. All that we do is touched by ocean, but we stand on the shore of what we know, which means that we get, we get a bit fussed about you know, doing things right, or or who sat there, or who's sitting in my that seat, or who's moved in that way, or whatever it might be, and um, and that can be, you know, if we're in this, if we're in this for anything, it's to it's to expand and deepen and and celebrate, isn't it? I mean, life as it as it can be, life as it is, um, and if we we're brilliant as human beings at just. Uh, continually confining, defining, shoving it into a box, shoving it into some kind of thing that we think we can know the beginning and the end of. So, it, you know, it, it's, we often we often use mystery as a way of saying we don't we you know it's the end of the sentence when we, yeah. we don't really know what we're talking about. Mm. But actually, you know, really to enter into the mystery of living, what it's really like to be alive. I mean, that's astonishing, mm. and and to try to continue to say that in the middle of the pandemic has been hard but i think that's been the unique unique i want to say unique vocation of a of a eucharistic community in this time mm. have you felt as a priest useful a lot of the time no no um and and that's been a, you know that's again i suppose i I would want to, at my best, welcome that, and say, I, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a person who, in this moment, can help, genuinely help to to get this, uh, or to or to move society into a better place. Um, You're a frontline worker, aren't you? <laughs> well, I think. 
that's been an interesting that's been a really interesting reflection and i think some some um it, perhaps it perhaps a lot of it has depended on context i mean of course i i, I mean I, yeah i i don't want to I, I don't want to make this into a kind of um a more sharply expressed observation than it needs to be but i think you know that there were, of course there were there were bits where i i mean i did go to some care homes and i held up phones and you know i helped people say goodbye to the people that they love so i'm i'm really not trying to i'm really not trying to step away from what was really you know some of the important stuff but at the same time i think certainly in the uk um there were some absolutely spectacular communities that really got going with their food banks and you know i'm, I'm sure you did we did we, we fed people who were homeless etc but fundamentally across the uk i think that one of the truths that was revealed by this pandemic is that um uh, the church had to kind of understand that there wasn't a kind of universal turning to us. Yeah. Um, there wasn't a kind of cry, why has God visited this on us? Let's go to the Church <laughs> of England to find out why. <laughs> there wasn't. And I think that's been really very good for us because it's, it's perhaps let us know that we were um, less regarded even than we thought we were. And that's not, that is absolutely not to take away from those individual moments. And I was talking to somebody last week who's been holding services in layperson, she's been holding services in the churchyard of her local church, um, just turned up in a graveyard, started reading out prayers. People came socially distanced and gathered and they just kind of got on with it while the church was shut, you know, fantastic. None of this is to, is to uh, talk down any of that. But I, I think as a whole, we've, we've kind of had to reckon it's been a moment of reckoning that actually you know a philosopher said to me recently if there were any moment where the church really could come into its own do you not think it would be in a global pandemic and while we have done a lot absolutely there hasn't been i i don't think a, a, a universal turning to the church to understand what has been happening and why it's been happening and this bit of me which quite there's also a bit of me which quite um which is which is quite proud of society for not doing that actually <laughs> quite proud of society go yeah. on yeah well I'm, in some ways i suppose because that means that people are thinking and they're they're not automatically going to you know they're not automatically going to be drawn to a to some by fear they're not going to come out of out of a kind of sense of obligation or fear or a fear of authority there's mm. none of that mm. and i think that's a good very good thing so um so it, but all it, what it means is that those of us in those Eucharistic communities have to be living a kind of gigantic invitation to say um, life is life is life can be like this. Mm. And it's if we if we can't communicate that um, well, then no wonder people are uh, uh, having a look and just, you know, and wandering off. The church, the, the, the society turned to Netflix, didn't it? <laughs> probably that's right yes i mean you know the, the 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 growth in craft the growth in walking in you know walking in woods all of that i think is absolutely fantastic i'm not I, i'm actually not i'm not really genuinely complaining about that i think yeah. it's a but i think it has been a bit of a reckoning if we thought we were key workers and frontline people um to some extent of course in certain circumstances yes we have been there but as a as a whole that hasn't been the answer. The church has been providing answers to questions no one's asking, which is one of our greatest talents, often. So, um, in terms of, could you say a little bit about the, the frenzy of of, um, of what the church has tried to do, a lot of it online, a lot of it in the sort of food bank world, that, that kind of desire to be relevant to be engaged could, could you reflect on that for a few moments i mean um i suppose you know the church the church as an the church as an institution i suppose i'm talking here about a national or international church mm -hmm. because it's made it's a human institution it's made up of flawed human beings 
So, of course, you know, some of our instincts are to to tr to try to do our absolute best mm. and um, and try hard not to um, be envious or worry about what we're not doing. Um, and I think that that betrays, you know, it betrays a kind of contemporary challenge for anyone trying to live a spiritual life, which is that there is so much to divert and distract us um, in, in modern living. There's so much opportunity for vacuous overactivity to fill whatever void it is that we've, we've got in here that, um, Again, I suppose the church is just not immune to that. I suppose that's all I would say. And, and we can, if we're not careful, believe the lie that our own, um, our own efforts and our own achievements can fill that mm. void. Um, doesn't mean to say that we, doesn't mean to say that we don't strive or try or create, et cetera, but, but I think competition can enter every aspect of human life. Um, Sarah Maitland used to talk about competitive vulnerability um, <laughs> in, uh, in the groups that she was part of in the 1970s, which I always thought was really good. Mm. And, you know, there can be competitive creativity as well. Mm. It's really good stuff. We, we've just got this great knack of, of making it into a competitive thing if we're not careful. So while there's been just fantastic, there has been some fantastic stuff, sometimes I've just, check myself ask myself mm. you know really really do we have to do we have to do that again or do that every day or do that you know twice a week or whatever it might be or um it, 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 if you if you have if you feel that you have to be seen to be responding well to the to the crisis who's that for mm. at whose service are we placing our creativity at whose feet do we place our precious gifts of energy and and ideas and solutions and it, it's really it's really easy for us to become idolatrous in that sense and place our place our energy and creativity and gifts at the feet of an idol which which can be our own ego can be you know a, a, a sense of as i was saying a sense of competitivity com competitiveness um, I mean, it can be anything. It's different for different people, but I, I, I just feel that that you know those ancient teachings of um, of faithfulness and idolatry are are as relevant today as they were then, just in different ways. I think a lot of it's about powerlessness, isn't it? That that I, mm. for me and people you know who are familiar with my stuff may have heard me say this before. But I, I, if I look back on thirty years in ministry, I see a one continuity above all, and that's that all the people I pastored have felt powerless almost mm. without exception even the exalted ones even the ones with Nobel prizes thought mm. it was a bad year and you know I didn't really deserve it and mm. you know I, I didn't do any good or they never applied my research to anything you know that there's always that sense of inadequacy mm. Mm. could you I wonder if you could talk personally mm. a, a, about what what you do with that sense of powerlessness I mean you you've talked vividly about how that can lead to hyperactivity, how that can lead to an idolatry of having the most creative Zoom call of all time and, and, and the, 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 the most well-adjusted YouTube Eucharist and, and this kind of thing. But what the, I see those as all a response to powerlessness. You know, if, if you can feel you've won a competition, then that takes your 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 attention away from, from the fact that you haven't, you know, the, 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 it seems to me that this pandemic has exposed our powerlessness more than almost anything else. I guess, I suppose I, I would say though, I, I, I agree with that, but I think, I suppose what I, maybe what I'm talking about is motivation in, the, in response to the powerlessness. Mm. Yes, I understand mm. that. But I think that to be, you know, to, to offer all that we, all that we have and all that we can be and do with our creativity is um, is a fantastic thing. Mm. I think I want to really emphasize that. But it's in whose service are we offering it? That's mm. always going to be the question. And and so if you do if you do do that stuff, and you're really constantly kind of interrogating the um, 
you're going back to basics the whole time as a community or in, or as an individual saying in in whose service am i am i placing this um or in whose service am i working for this mm. then um then i suppose that I, I mean again people will have heard me say this before perhaps but the chief spiritual <laughs> discipline or chief spiritual task it seems to me for a priest and for any christian but for a priest in, in the eucharistic sense is not to think up you know the most amazing um all singing all dancing eucharist on ice or whatever it might be the, the most important thing is to keep returning to the source of true creativity which is god obviously and for a priest i think it's kind of for me is that space behind the altar which is which is incredibly feels incredibly spacious and and creative so our chief spiritual discipline is simply to return that's all we have to do return 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 because in returning is the renewal of our strength so it's when i don't return that i get lost and it's when i don't go back to that place of my first love as it were when i don't go back to that then that's when i get lost and can get very i can get disorientated and um and and exhausted by the vacuous overactivity that i was mentioning so the powerlessness what do you do with your powerlessness? I think you kind of, you kind of carry it, you know, bleeding and um, and crumpled as it is, and just return to the place where you knew what you were doing this for in the first place. I'm talking as an ordained person now, and unless I return there, I, I can't. I just can't go on. Now, I think one of the things that people admire most about you is that you are able to navigate some of the most some of the rawest issues in church and society so we've had some pretty raw issues that have come to the surface in the last year the black lives matter movement possibly the most explicit but climate change obviously and and uh, and you have modeled at st james's by gesture as well as word ways of a community responding to um, a situation where maybe words are, are, are not really adequate um, I wonder if you could talk about where you draw your sources of inspiration from and, and how you make judgments in the face of some of these very controversial questions that go you know, right to the heart of our society. Um, what, what forms you? What, what, what gives you confidence and conviction that this is the way to go, this is the gesture to make? Um, I, I think maybe maybe going back to your theme of um, improvisation, um, and, and also that it's not so. Uh, yeah, so I think you're probably talking about some of the some of the installations or the art installations or the symbolic things that have, that we've done over the years. I mean, there's there's one that I was just speaking about today, so it's in my mind. Um, it's from a couple of years ago um, from somebody in our somebody in our congregation, an artist in our congregation called Sarah Mark. So she um, just just so I just so we put some flesh on these bones, yeah. I think. So she she fr she filled an oil barrel with water and froze it, and then uh, removed the ice inside of the oil barrel, as it were, and then suspended it over the oil barrel, and then melted the ice into the oil barrel, and then there was a um, microphone in the bottom of the organ so it was then spread throughout the church so we celebrated the Eucharist we did all of our normal services mm. all, all over the weekend um, in the presence of melting ice real melting ice and listening to it um, that and we put it deliberately in the middle of the church which really you know, there were some people who were pretty annoyed by it in the sense that they have to go around it but that's the point <laughs> that's right. um there was one really good moment i mean you also have to sit lightly to some of the, some of mm. this but there was a very good moment when we were installing it the night before and there were about three or four of us there and we couldn't get the ice melted sufficiently to take it out of the <laughs> to take it out of the uh, oil barrel mm. so somebody just said well we'll just turn the boiler up for a short time <laughs> 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 and we all just said, yeah, no, 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 that is so. the point. That is actually the whole really point of this thing. Yeah. So um, so I think that also <laughs> that's really good because that narrate, you know, that mm. just means that we're because you can also start to feel very 
pleased with yourself mm. with these things and you you know you start to feel that you've got some kind of answer clearly haven't because we were going to turn the boiler up to install mm. this piece about climate change so that those kinds of moments are really really important um that any sense of hubris or I, I, I keep remembering the um, line from the Magnificat that God has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Mm. So imagination is not enough in itself. Mm. You can be as you can be as imaginative as you like, but that's not the point. It's again this idolatrous and in whose service uh, stuff I was talking about before. So um, so I think um, I mean you know St James is St James is as a congregation as other congregations is simply a place where people um, believe themselves. And, uh, and and know themselves to be creative themselves mm. and that's that's something that was there long before I went there so uh, and I I've simply I'm simply riding that wave that's how I feel about it um and I think to in the in the role of a in the role of a priest sometimes all that you can be is um is a kind of some somehow a permission giver although actually it doesn't need your permission but somehow there's a there's a spoken out of that um, create that space creation that means that people um, they they do they do what is in them. So over the pandemic last year, um, there was a wheat growing project in the courtyard, and and you know for for completely unexpected reasons, um, I became the wheat farmer. I had to look after the wheat in a way that I never would have anticipated before. So of course everyone gets involved you know people are sending me videos about how to thin the wheat <laughs> and we had people who actually knew how to do this so I was on the on the phone you know trying to thin this wheat out and um so I mean you know some as you're, I think you're right that sometimes um symbolism is is it is really important but I think also um and this is also something that I think we have to be wary of that sometimes we can believe that if we've done something symbolic then that's we've done it we, we've 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 confronted injustice <laughs> or it has been fixed in some way and that is simply not true mm. and and we're quite fond it seems to me um of of symbolic action um which is which is very important in itself but if actual change and this is where i suppose the black lives matter um movement would would be um properly interrogating those kinds of symbolic um actions to say um, it's not enough, it's not enough. Actual change, actual equality, actual repentance from white church leaders like me, mm. that's the only place to start with this discussion. Um, and, and I think that's, so, that, so, the, so the symbolic side is very important, um, but it also has to be, you have to keep kind of also bringing yourself back to saying what, what actual change is needed and how do I, contribute how do I become part of that movement of the spirit from um, from chaos to order and from Babel to Pentecost mm. Mm. and I mean if we could stay with race for a moment a lot of the attention has been on the structures of the of the Church of England uh, when it's come to you know bringing it to a British context what can a local congregation do either on a pastoral or a prophetic level um, to go back to the phrase we used earlier to be an example of God's future to, 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 for others to say this this would be a wonderful way to live I mean you know in in uh, in the church I'm in at the moment I think um, that's the place that um, we as a congregation led by the congregation uh, led by people in the congregation have chosen to start is by um, reading Ben Lindsay's book we need to talk about race together so I think just under 50 people um, signed up to do this on Zoom over the next few weeks um, and I think as far as the group who, who set this up is concerned deliberately chosen that particular book because it is about um, a, as it says in the subtitle black experience in a white majority church and we are a white majority church, so I think it, it perhaps it's perhaps it's interrogating perspective to some degree to say that yes, okay, this particular congregation is a white majority church, and perhaps in the UK the Anglican Church is a white majority church, but the Anglican Church um, globally is certainly not a white majority church. So so be careful how you mm -hmm. start to speak about majorities and minorities, and and what what perspective are you talking about? Mm -hmm. um, 
I think um, we were talking recently about, um, yes, racism is a structural sin and all the liberation theology will want to make sure that that's absolutely understood. It is also a personal sin and to try uh, to try to interrogate oneself about that. Um, certainly as a certainly as a white person that's been that's been a very important part of this as far as I've, I've been concerned to really try to be to try to learn to, to try to listen and more than that to be part of a movement that is uh, you know together trying to trying to make real change in mm -hmm. our church um, and I think you can only start well yes I mean it seems to me you can only really start with um, having having conversations that you may have avoided that i may have avoid, have avoided you know some years ago or or um, or not felt able to have have them and that requires as i said it's not only naming the structural uh, structural racism it's naming a kind of um, personal um, courage and a personal commitment one on one or in a small group that you can just try and say stuff that you haven't said before. Mm. That's where mercy and trust come back in. They certainly do. I'm going to ask Jonathan now to, to bring in some of the comments because I've seen a lot of comments coming in. I just haven't been able to read them. So yeah, Jonathan, give us, give us a, a, maybe a couple we can take at a time. Yeah, sure. So there's a couple of questions about uh, helpful aspects of worship in the virtual space. So Rosie's asked, interested in the Eucharist uh, sacrament, uh, sacramentality virtually, what is possible, what difference does it make? And John Woodhouse has said, for me, the table of the word has become very important and the prayer life of St. Martin's has been a great discovery. Will churches keep on live streaming? Do you want to talk about the first part of that? Um, Yes, I mean, in, in terms of <laughs> in terms of what's been helpful online. Or, yes, yeah, I, I think yeah, so. What, 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 what is online made possible, yeah. rather than it being a poor version of, yeah. of something else? What yeah. is it? A, a oh, there's huge advantages. Yeah, huge advantages. I suppose I, I think it's made our homes, or um, if we're lucky enough to have stable Wi-Fi and privacy, then it's made some people's homes a place of prayer in a way that they weren't before. I think that it's made churches more accessible in every possible way. Um, so, uh, so for people with impairments who found it quite difficult to access church buildings or to travel to church, that's been that's as far as I you know mm -hmm. have heard people say that's exactly that's been a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. um, so I think ac accessibility has been um, fantastic. At the same time, again, it's still it's still divided isn't it i mean mm. because as i just mentioned if you don't have stable wi-fi or if you don't have um privacy in your own space then it has been more tricky to be part of that community so in, in each of these there's there's pros and cons um but i think the breakout rooms from zoom have been have been fantastic for us again i've heard many people are just saying to be put randomly in a room <laughs> Uh, with three or four people that you have seen a bit, but you mm. don't can't remember their names and mm. their names are written on, which is even yes. better. Um, you can actually connect and make and make real relationships mm. in a way that you know coffee after the service or a course or you know we'll run all the usual you know courses and groups as much as any other parish. But I think it's really deepened and transformed the relationships with within the congregation with each other, and that that's been just fantastic. I don't know how you yes I, I i think a lot of people have mocked the fact that the average length of time someone spends watching a service is you know just a few a few minutes and and and, and a lot of people visit five different services in the course of a sunday morning or something like that people have mocked that but i i think it's it's basically saying it's giving a much better opportunity for people to look to see where they belong and just have a taste without the anxiety of, yeah. of the personal rejection yeah. in either direction. So, Jonathan, give us a couple more. Yeah, uh, so we've got a question about imagination and creativity. Um, is it not always grounded in going toward uh, whatever the challenge or issue is that is presenting itself and inviting people to do the same, or sometimes putting it in the center where it can't be missed? I think it was what you just said, really, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. About your barrel. Yes, I think 
and I think imagination is absolutely um, a gift. It's a gift from God. I suppose what I'm trying to caution against is um, is us, um, especially when when you know when we are creative together, that we we recognise the source of that creativity and to whom that creativity belongs, because you know imagination can be used in really you know in, in more imaginative ways to execute people or to mm. hurt them or to uh or to uh, you know to 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 divide us so I, will, I think all i'm saying is that imagination in itself or creativity in itself is not necessarily um is not necessarily of god unless it is uh recognized where that creativity comes from and placed back in god's hands So we've got um, two comments about the kinds of attitudes that might sustain us um, in the current circumstances. Um, Claire's quoted, uh, for all that has been, thanks for all that is to come, yes. Um, and we've also uh, had a uh, reference to some writings from Charles Williams and to Gerard Manley Hopkins's poem about patience. So. Um, mm. Yeah, any response to those attitudes as a kind of key way of getting through? Well, there's there's something that I've just just responded to there. Thank you very much to the person who talked about patience. The um the German theologian of whom I'm a great fan, Dorothy Zuller, who who died in the 90s. She she talked about revolutionary patience, and I I I found myself preaching that quite a bit mm -hmm. this year. And I think revolutionary patience has the kind of energy and spaciousness in it that is what that's that's what I feel has is getting me through that there is of course there's an element of waiting but it's not stagnant waiting it's it's expecting revolution or or understanding that 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 level of of patience can in itself uh, stimulate a revolutionary attitude to living that is what's needed so patience is often couched in quite passive terms, but revolutionary patience, I think, is something that you can you can cultivate in a in a prayer life that could really really change things. So I'm ex I, I feel very energized by mm. that. <laughs> I think there's really I would say there's two kinds of patience. There's the patience that knows to use language I've used elsewhere that we're in Act Four of a five act play. Act Five is coming. The the end of the world, heaven, etc. Uh, you know, the, the, the vital acts have already happened, creation, Israel, Jesus, we're at the church stage, we can be patient because we know Act 5 is coming, God will finally close the story. That's a, one kind of patience. There's another kind of patience where we don't know yet what the story is. Mm. And you have to wait until you, your story, and until you know what the story is, you can't work out what your place in the story is. Mm -hmm. And that's, I feel I've been more in touch with the second kind mm -hmm. uh, in the last year. Than I have been and, and as a leader I felt my job was to tell the story as best I could to the community to help them locate their place in that story small story of what's happening at St Martin's and the various ups and downs of the last mm. year but also that the story of the gospel the story of the world as well mm. so maybe time for just just one one or two more uh, a couple yeah more. absolutely so there's a great one that's just come in from Esther um, using the jazz analogy have you become more attuned to the dissonant during the pandemic? And is it worth making more space for it as we move forward? Mm. I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of um, dissonance in, in religious practice, um, just because I think it's, what, it's how the world is. So I, I, I don't like, and this just really translates very straightforwardly into church music. I don't really like it when all music in a, in a, in a service um, resolves. Or everything ends up as like ta-da <laughs> because just for most people in the world life is not like mm. that and if we can't bring that dissonance into a church I don't know where we're I don't know where we're going to really listen to it so um and I, I don't mean just all the all the kind of music that you need tuning forks for and you know the lots of music that was written um written in the 20th century mid 20th century that's that's just difficult and everyone's desperate for a tune after all three distance. and a half hours yes, yeah. all this is, I don't just mean that I mean that there has to be there has to be that, you know, that uh, um, deep brokenness that we all carry. It has to be expressed in, in church, which I think is expressed by dissonance. Have I become more attuned to that? I, I think um, 
Pro probably, probably yes, I would say. Um, I think I want to find a way, I want to find a way not only to, to listen to that, but to, but to sing. And I think if I, if I had to say what I think my role is as a priest, you know, for, for church and society, it's almost to say, it's almost to invite people to say that there is a song that is being sung right now and you are invited to join it with your own voice. And if you're going to take some time to figure out what that voice sounds like, that's that's great. You you figure that out. But there is something for you to sing. And um, that doesn't have to be pretty and it doesn't have to resolve and it doesn't have to be a cadence that, you know, eventually tells you that everything is going to be OK. Um, it can be unfinished and it can be dissonant as long as it's yours. I think we're done. Uh, it's. Um... It's seven o'clock. It's a, a beautiful note on which to end. And uh, I want to thank everyone for joining uh, in, in this conversation. Um, just to let you know, uh, lots of Heart Edge events that you can find out about, uh, most particularly on the second Thursday of next month, June, I'll be in conversation with Anthony Reddy, uh, one of Britain's best known black theologians. Um, and as well as thanking everyone who set this up tonight, uh, our team that have worked hard to bring this about and publicize it, I most especially want to thank Lucy for being such a wonderful example. Uh, I, well, I'm not going to say the dissonance part, but all the other parts, uh, <laughs> such a wonderful inspiration to so many of us and especially to me. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you.